Thank you, Olaf. Uh, I'm going to start by making an apology. I'm going to sit down to do this presentation. I've been traveling for a week with a, a little bit of back trouble, and I hope none of you know what that means. Uh, not a lot of fun. You will notice from my first slide that I have indeed been in Ghent before. Uh, in fact, one of the technicians tells me that that's the van that they use parked in front of the sign. Uh, this is from the uh, World Climate Summit a few years ago. It was put up in, by, the, by the main campus in the center of town. Uh, the next big thing will be a lot of small things. And I think that carries an important message, not just about climate and climate change, a theme which I'll actually return to, uh, but also about the way that we look at software and the way, in particular, that systems to support learning, teaching, and research, the academic mission, might be configured in the future. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so first of all, Aperio, the Aperio Foundation is a non-profit registered in the United States. Registered in the United States uh, as a non-profit for the reason that many of the, the software communities we are the umbrella for, uh, started in the US, but also for the profoundly sensible reason uh, that some legal folks from Princeton gave us pro bono work on setting up a nonprofit. I want to talk about the why of open source. I want to issue a, a little reminder about why we believe open source software is an important factor in higher education institutional strategy or why it should be. I want to talk a little bit about the, the international context of higher education at present because I think it's important that we, we remind ourselves, as Olaf said, I said yesterday morning in Paris, we have to remind ourselves of why we're here. So over the last 10, 12 years, we've seen some changing fashions in uh, thinking about IT systems. Um, in the United States, the term cloud first came to be used, which really meant that before you considered any other solution, you considered a cloud solution. But that had a tendency to turn into cloud only. Uh, it's typically made with proprietary software. It's a proprietary solutions. There's an impact uh, on institutional capacity. The CIO of one institution in the US told me that uh, she had, in fact, got rid of developers uh, but had to hire contract managers because they were moving so many issues to the cloud. There are also issues, I think, with proprietary cloud software about the degree of flexibility it affords, and that's particularly important in areas that we work in uh, supporting learning. Uh, there's a tendency also for cloud vendors to uh, lock customers in, uh, and indeed the cloud may be better locks. Not the only cause for concern, though. Uh, this is a graphic from a, a mailing list called the EdTech mailing list from about a year ago, uh, a list which I'd encourage you to, to take a look at. But if you look across the top there, you will see how much student data is actually being kept by cloud vendors. Now, there's been something of an argument on several mailing lists recently uh, connected with the acquisition by a private equity company of uh, Instructure, the parent co company for Canvas. Uh, Instructure have made some strong comments this week, some strong statements about their use of data and allowing opt-out of data. But that really was a result of, uh, of customer pressure and above all, customer concern. Now, at one end of the, the spectrum, uh, who came across this book over the course of the last year? It's been out about a year. A US-based academic, Shizana Zuboff, writes about what she's termed surveillance capitalism, uh, about creating prediction products, about <coughs> behavioral futures markets being created, and all based on massively scaled data gathering. Some serious questions there about whether this involves manipulation, whether it's a threat to individual self-determination, and not all uh, legal jurisdictions have the same protection afforded uh, that we have in Europe 
by the GDPR. Uh, and there are questions about whether it's actually capable of regulation. So last summer, Facebook were fined five billion uh, for privacy violations. Just pause for a moment. What happened the day after that fine? Come on, somebody must remember this. Well, it refers, the question refers to the share price. That's what happened to the share price. So the five billion fine was not really something that Facebook was particularly concerned about. I was at a conference last year of New York CIOs, New York State CIOs. Now, I don't get to listen to too many presentations from Gartner these days. Maybe you do. Um, but I found one comment that the presenter made interesting, that there was a rebalancing going on or begun in education, a conversation really about where compute power was located, where storage was located, and a balancing of the edge, very, very local necessity of compute power, private clouds and public clouds. And it reminded me of a conversation in the UK several years ago where people began to talk about services within higher education as core and chore. Core being those systems that you wanted to retain maximum control over around learning, teaching, and research, the academic mission, in other words, and chore, which were services which could be distributed outside the institution. If you've come across Ben Verdmuller, he was one of the founders of ELG, Collaboration Environment, a few years ago. I don't often read quotations from slides, but I do want to read this one because I think it's important. In education, government, and anywhere primarily supported by public funding, it makes sense to use software that doesn't lock you in or quietly convert public funds into private equity. And I think that summed the perspective up rather well. Because, of course, if you look, and I'm not naming the company here, although I may have already referred to it, I'll leave you to guess. An initial public offering in higher education space a few years ago shows an interesting proportion of company spend. 52% on sales, 25% on admin, and 24% on research and development. Now, as an organization, we're profoundly about higher education keeping its resources where they should be focused, the benefit of the academic mission. But those proprietary license fees that are paid pay for wrappers, Ferris wheels, all kinds of stuff in terms of marketing. But at the same time, I think it's important that we remind ourselves of the global picture of student debt. Now, it's difficult. Uh, of course, license fees are not the sole cause of student debt, but they're a, a significant factor. Student debt at the moment in the UK, the average student debt is running at 42,500 euro at graduation. In the US, and there's a lot, this average hides a lot of, vari of variation, about 33,500. In Germany, 5,600. There's a significant difference there. And in France, the only statistic I could find, hence the note about comparability, was that only 2% of students take out loans. So it's a hugely varied global picture. But as commercial proprietary license fees are paid by institutions, uh, debt is passed on. Open source software is really profoundly for an institution about cost, suitability, and control. Licensing costs saved on commercial proprietary software can be invested in capacity to solve the problems your institution faces. You upgrade according to your plan, not the vendor's plan. You don't outsource your IT strategy to a vendor. And needs can be realized directly and shared. And we are profoundly about enabling collaboration between higher education institutions in the same way that the OpenCast community works together to meet institutional needs. I think we also need to remind ourselves that e-learning is not a product category or a product. It's not something you buy. We should always be learning about learning and we should be playing that learning back into innovation. Uh, and in doing that, we can collaborate and cooperate to reduce costs. This term has been around for a few years now. 
the educators call it the next generation digital learning environment. It was an attempt to map a more flexible system of the future. I think it's important that we recognize the plurality in this, that the, the posited flexibility that we require will lead to very different needs being met in different ways at different institutions. But you can be sure that the reuse of open source code, whether that's OpenCast code or Sakai code or uPortal code, open source code is likely to be highly important in that space. But again, it's important to emphasize this isn't a product category, it's an approach to the construction of software to serve the academic mission. And just as an example, a couple of examples, Dayton University, a relatively small institution in the United States, has had learning technologists produce small niche components. These are not components which perhaps are required to run out to the entire institution, but meet a particular need, sometimes in, case, in, in the case of one course. And they're making them available in an app store integrated with their learning management system, and they're finding they can produce 50 or 60 of these tools a year. They don't expect all of them to succeed, uh, but they do meet particular niches. Duke University, a major research institution in the States, taking a very similar approach, but as well as components that they're making and sharing, they're integrating services like Slack and GitHub in their environment, but again, using the app store metaphor and approach to enable choice. And it's interesting that both those institutions are headed slightly different ways, but profoundly in the direction that Educores have mapped out. So I'm sure one of the things you will be thinking about is what the implications are in that future world for, for OpenCast. And already by supporting standards like LTI, you are playing into that future space. I think also, though, there's, there's a lot of research, both academic research and, let's say, more pop research, about how diverse communities support innovation over time. And again, that's profoundly what we're about. We're a membership organization. We have some commercial affiliates, commercial partners as members, but we are profoundly a membership organization of higher education in the US, in Europe, in South Africa, in Japan, and elsewhere in the world. We believe in building strong partnerships. I've come from a conference in Paris yesterday where Olaf and Rudiger were speaking about OpenCast of a French consortium called Aesop Portai. Again, around 80, uh, 72, 73 French institutions, about 80% of higher education who work very closely with us. They support and adopt some of our software, uh, and they also produce their own software and support French higher ed. So we're about the collaborative and cooperative management of intellectual property, uh, and that can be not just code, but other artifacts, of course, documentation, other efforts, and again, sustainability through cooperation. I want to raise a personal perspective at this point, just something that uh, I think we have to consider into the future. I've pointed some of the dangers uh, out of the, the commercial proprietary cloud Already in France, in Canada, and elsewhere, institutions are thinking about cooperation, about building services around cooperative principles by higher education, for higher education, built around uh, open source software with a role for commercial partners, but on the basis that auditability uh, underpins trust, and open source software is auditable, unlike commercial proprietary software. And with open and agreed affordances for innovation. So collectively and cooperatively reaching out for that future. What's coming up in the coming year? Uh, open Aperio is our main conference of the year, although we support uh, regional events and com other community events during the course of the year. 
Uh, we're looking at a very different conference this year. We're going to be hosted at the University of Michigan. That's allowing us to reduce the cost very considerably. We will have a day, the first day, where attendees will be able to get an overview of the 16 or 17 software communities that Aperio supports, and Opencast will be, uh, will be one of those. We're going to have a second day led by learning technologists and others, bringing a diverse group of people together to look at realizing some, uh, some digital pedagogy challenges, and we're going to have a couple of days of community presentations where it's possible to learn um, in detail about how a particular institution uses open source software to serve the academic mission. Uh, we're strengthening our partnerships. I mentioned ASA Portai. We also work closely with the LAMP consortium. Confusingly, LAMP has got nothing to do with the LAMP software stack. It's an organization of small institutions, by which I mean between 250, 300 full-time equivalents and 1,500, who, who work together to support open source software. And again, cooperatively hosted. Uh, by commercial partners and others. We're going to continue to strengthen our regional organizations in South Africa and Japan, uh, and we're going to do that, uh, hopefully, in a way which meets a broader sustainability challenge than sustaining open source software. Uh, if we are going to have sustainable open source software in a more sustainable planet, we have to find ways of facilitating low-carbon cooperation, not flying around the world hundreds of times in order to collaborate and cooperate. Face-to-face uh, -face meetings are probably always going to be important, but we have to change their shape over time. That's a very big challenge, but it's one that I feel we have to address at present. So, thank you again to Olaf and the Opencast board for the invitation. I hope I have kept within my allotted time. Uh, and if we do have time, I'm very happy to answer any questions. If not, I'm going to be around for most of today, although sadly not tomorrow. Grab me in the coffee break or lunch break if you'd like to talk about anything further. Thanks for listening. Despite your, your back pain, all the best for you. Any questions you would like to raise right now? Greg? I'm just curious about this la, uh, LAMP organization. Um, that sounds specifically the institution that I originated from would fit in with that fairly well. And despite my best efforts, whenever I talk to somebody there, they're completely uninterested in hosting, or hosting their own OpenCast install. But if there's somebody who could be hosting OpenCast, especially in North America, that would actually be something that I'd be very interested in talking to them about. Um, so I was just wondering, what, like, what are they um, called? Because when I Google for LAMP organization, there's a whole lot of them. There are indeed a whole lot of them. There are a lot of problems with that name. I'll, I'll put you in direct touch with them, Greg, because they, I mean, they've started by hosting Sakai. They're now. Uh, hosting the Karuta Next Generation ePortfolio solution, which is, I learned yesterday, getting more and more traction in France with some 30 institutions running pilots and, or, or services. So I can put you in direct touch with, with the, the, the folks who coordinate LAMP uh, and assess their level of, of interest. I'd be highly confident that many of them are unaware that OpenCast can be run in that way. And they've probably ruled out uh, the kind of solution that OpenCast offers because they didn't know it was possible. But th that's probably made the trip worthwhile. Any other questions? So uh, I presume you can do that for yourself, but uh, let me... Uh tell you how I connected the dots in that uh, using open source software uh, in the uh, video management domain is something that, for example, allowed an institution like Ghent to grow in the way that they have done 
without additional cost on licensing, for example, or on uh, other matters that come with uh, scaling your services, which is uh, part of the offering of uh, an open source software like Opencast, which is good to see that you can grow from starting with 20 capture agents to 100 without uh, that burden upon you, let alone the other stuff that Ian indicated can happen when you're with a proprietary service. Okay, that was that for the introduction, and I think uh, it's 